Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Robbins. I am the uh, Professor for, in Practice for Sustainable Finance at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. And I'll be your moderator for today. It's a delight uh, to be with you. Um, we will be going through uh, a new publication, the Toolbox for Sustainable Crisis Response Measures for S Central Banks and Supervisors, which has been uh, co-authored by Simon Dickow, a colleague of mine at, at Grantham LSE, but also Uli Voltz, who's the director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance. Um, this is a, a paper which is obviously responding to the terrible crisis we're seeing now. Uh, central banks have clearly been uh, critical in terms of the response. And the paper really tries to see how that can be connected with the wider action central banks are thinking about in terms of sustainability and, and climate. So in terms of the, the, the format for today, um, Uli uh, and then Simon will make a presentation of the sort of the key structure uh, and the key recommendations uh, of the paper. And then we're delighted to have uh, three expert respondents. Uh, first, we'll have Frank Pierschel, who is both the Chief Sustainable Finance Officer and also the Head of International Banking Supervision at BaFin in Germany. So welcome, Frank. Then we'll be followed by uh, Eileen Mon Monasterolo, who is Assistant Professor of Climate Economics and Finance uh, at the Vienna University of Economics. Welcome, Irene, also a, uh, a participant in the Inspire Research Program. And then Ilmi Granhoff, who is the Finance Program Director at ClimateWorks and is also the co-chair of Inspire, the, the research uh, program. So this will be an interactive session. Um, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. Please do use the Q&A function. Um, and then I will um, take questions from that and we'll, um, we'll, we'll pose those to, to the panelists. We will be running until quarter past the hour. Um, this is because uh, we want to make sure that we can have some, some in-depth discussion and, and get uh, below the surface of some of these issues. Um, and uh, this allows our respondents and, and panelists and, and presenters to really go into a bit of detail. So without further ado, Uli, I'd like to hand over to you to, to get things underway. Many thanks. Thank you, Nick, and warm welcome also from my side. So um, just to say that uh, the webinar today is part of a research project on sustainable crisis responses of central banks and financial supervisors that is kindly supported by the Inspire Network and uh, jointly run by uh, the Center for Sustainable Finance uh, East 3 g uh, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at Cambridge University and the CSEN Center in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and uh, there are quite a lot of uh, interesting related events happening and there will be also uh, related publications, so stay tuned. But I will now uh, turn to uh, presenting together with Simon uh, the toolbox that, as uh, Nick mentioned, we have put together as a uh, input uh, for central banks and supervisors to navigate the crisis. And um, I'll try to uh, highlight a few important points and then Simon will uh, go through uh, some of the instruments uh, in a bit more detail. Central banks and also supervisors are playing a very, very important role in the current crisis. And that is both true for the immediate stabilization phase uh, but also for the recovery phase, which hopefully will start soon. And even though um, central banks and supervisors are very much concerned about very current developments uh, and, and short-term um, challenges, uh, it's also important to highlight that many of the policies that are being adopted uh, during these uh, difficult times will have profound long-term implications. So even though crisis response measures are geared toward short-term pressures, they will have to be consistent with long-term goals, especially uh, long-term climate and sustainability goals, uh, with which we are concerned uh, in this discussion here, uh, and support a just transition to a sustainable economy. So some would say, well, you know, this is a, a time of crisis. Um, central bank supervisors are firefighting one of the, the most terrible crises we've seen in generations. Why care about climate change and sustainability? And we argue that there are four reasons why this has to be on the agenda. Um, first of all, when we look at central banks, 
um, central banks should make sure that they themselves are not exposing themselves to material climate related risks. And even though we know that central banks can't really go bankrupt, um, when they are conducting, for example, asset purchase uh, programs or loading up uh, further assets uh, through other operations, um, they need to account for climate risk. Um, because uh, as has been pointed out by a growing number of central banks uh, in the framework of the NGFS, um, climate risk is a material risk for financial stability. And so that also has to uh, be handled uh, in the operations of central banks. Central banks and supervisors uh, are, if you can go back please, um, central banks and supervisors uh, are of course also uh, responsible for safeguarding individual uh, uh, financial stability of individual financial st uh, institutions as well as of the financial system at large uh, and need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, banks and other financial firms uh, don't load up on climate risk uh, in the current situation. Um, and I'll get back to this point uh, just in a moment. And uh, last but not least, um, central banks and supervisors as public bodies um, have a responsibility within their mandates to support uh, government's climate goals and, and sustainability goals. So um, there is a very, very strong uh, role central banks and supervisors can play in aligning the financial system with sustainability. Um, and it's important to highlight uh, that given the climate challenge and also other environmental challenges, um, there is very little time to align the financial system with sustainability and therefore um, this cannot be dropped from, from uh, the attention of supervisors and, and central banks. Next one, please. So we are paying or emphasizing very much in, in our uh, policy brief, um, the financial stability uh, risks um, we're facing. Um, so in this situation, central banks and supervisors have been uh, trying to uh, provide liquidity to financial markets. And the risk is that if um, sustainability and climate risks are not being taken into account, this can contribute to a further buildup of climate risk, sustainability risk in portfolios uh, of individual institutions, but also of the financial system and economy at large. Um, so even though it's very uh, sensible to ease countercyclical and other prudential instruments at this point in time, uh, it is important to do it in a sustainability risk sensitive way. And uh, uh, it is therefore important that prudential instruments, which have been discussed uh, by central banks and supervisors uh, for quite a while now, um, uh, that they um, should not be delayed that um, uh, kind of uh, is a clear signal from financial authorities to financial firms to take climate and sustainability risk into account. Next one, please. The good news is that there are indeed quite a lot of uh, instruments, both on the monetary and prudential side, that can be calibrated in climate or sustainability uh, aligned ways. Um, and contribute uh, to the SDG and climate agenda. And I'll just give a few examples. Simon will uh, go into uh, more detail with, with other instruments. Um, so collateral frameworks have been uh, rightly described as an important potential tool uh, that can be employed. For example, um, uh, central banks can apply haircuts or exclude uh, certain assets, dirty assets that are not uh, aligned with sustainability and climate goals. Um, so that can be a very powerful tool. Uh, refinancing operations uh, can be aligned with sustainability goals. Uh, when uh, looking at further prudential instruments, um, reserve requirements, risk weights can, uh, can be differentiated according to uh, carbon footprint or whatever sustainability measure you want to take. And last but not least, uh, central banks that are conducting uh, corporate asset purchase programs um, could, and I would indeed say should, 
exclude certain carbon intensive assets because um, by providing uh, financial support to industries that are at the heart of the problem, um, this is not really, or this is perpetuating um, uh, kind of the carbon intensity of our economies. Uh, and this is not in line uh, with what central banks uh, have been uh, learning over the past couple of years with respect to climate risk. And I hand over to Simon. Yes, um, many thanks, Uli. I would, I would like to now quickly walk you through, um, through the toolbox itself. So our toolbox is, of course, well, informed by global experience, and we are very aware that there's uh, no one-size-fits-all approach. And, and our toolbox, therefore, reflects different financial cultures, policy spaces, op and objectives of, of central banks and supervisors um, around the world. And, and there are two key aspects here. First, instruments that are seen as standard by some central banks and, and supervisors may not be conventionally used elsewhere. And secondly, central banks and supervisors across different jurisdictions operate within very different or potentially very different mandates and legal frameworks. Um, yes, the toolbox itself has, has three overall areas, monetary policy, prudential policy, and other. And we have nine policy instrument subcategories. For each instrument, we point out first how a conventional sustainability blind calibration looks like, and then how a sustainability enhanced calibration could potentially, could potentially look like. Um, yes, in the first category, monetary policy, we have collateral frameworks, indirect monetary policy instruments, non-standard instruments, and direct monetary policy instruments, uh, some of which can, of course, be used to, to also affect the allocation of credit. For, for most of these instruments, there are specific proposals for how um, they could be aligned with, with sustainability goals. For others, these, these are still being worked out. The second category, uh, financial regulation and supervision. Here we, we have microprudential instruments, uh, instruments, for example, stress testing, disclosure, other Basel III instruments. And uh, well, with regard to, to, a, um, to, a, to a sustainability aligned calibration, we have climate risk stress test, mandatory disclosure, of course, and then also a climate risk sensitive calibration of, of various instruments, for example, um, differential risk-based capital requirements. In our macroprudential um, instrument category, we differentiate between cyclical instruments such as counter-cyclical capital buffers and, and the cross-sectional dimension, for example, um, large exposure restrictions. Um, yes, uh, the third category, other policies here, we, 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 have, we have a few different instruments, further financing schemes and other initiatives, for example, corporate financing facilities or loan guarantees and financial sector bailouts. We would argue that, that some of these could be, could be made conditional on the reduction of CO2 emissions or focus on sustainability enhancing activities. Uh, then we have the management of central bank portfolios here, um, um, well, disclosure of climate-related financial risks could be a very important first step in this regard. And then finally, support for sustainable finance activities, which should be rolled out and not be delayed despite, despite the current crisis. Yes, the emerging evidence base. Um, so to test our, our classification and toolbox empirically, we looked at all currently used crisis response measures that have been implemented by central banks or supervisors uh, in countries with at least one NGFS member institution. So this got us to around uh, um, 60 countries where we assessed the policies and we, we looked at them based on the IMF's policy response to COVID-19 tracker. An interesting finding is this, that most, if not all of the instruments that we propose in the toolbox are currently used, however, not in a sustainability enhancing way. And uh, well, with regard to different instruments, we find that on monetary policy, many central banks have moved very quickly in, in, in March and April to extend their collateral frameworks and to include a much broader variety and quality of assets. And then on, on supervision, many central banks and supervisors were, were also very quick to ease, well, expectedly counter cyclical capital buffers and general microprudential uh, regulation and supervisory standards. And yeah, overall, we have not been able to identify any monetary or prudential crisis response instrument 
instruments that have been calibrated in a sustainability enhanced way. However, there are, there are some positive examples um, of, of financial authorities that are advancing um, this, um, their sustainability agenda despite the current situation. Uh, yeah, for example, ongoing efforts in China would be would be an example, or or the launch of sustain um, of sustainable finance committees and frameworks in Mexico and the Philippines, and the NGFS has of course been very active in the past in 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 the past month in launching new reports and research, and uh, also very interesting last week, uh, Christine Lagarde in an interview with the FT has indicated that that asset purchase programs could be used to to pursue green objectives potentially. Um, yes, to conclude, two, two interesting initial conclusions. First, many changes have not been fully implemented yet, and the dynamic nature provides considerable scope for central banks and supervisors to retrofit sustainability factors into their, into their crisis response measures, we would argue. And secondly, the policy response also demonstrates that a broad set of instruments is potentially at the disposal of central banks and supervisors. And yeah, we would argue here that to some degree, this renders ongoing debates redundant regarding the, avail the availability of a number of these more unconventional instruments. Uh, well, because some of these are currently used and they have been discussed in the past by central banks and, and supervisors as not being suitable for adjustment that would allow for, for greening the economy. However, yeah, quite a few are used, most of them to, um, to support the SME sector. That's, that's a priority sector currently for, for some of these instruments. We, yeah, to conclude, this bears the question whether this created now some policy space and an opportunity to, to green central banking and further scale up green finance and to further include climate risks in, in binding regulation and, and supervisory standards. And yes, that's it from my side. Well, thanks so much, Lily. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sam, for running through that. Uh, very good. Um, if our panelists could um, could uh, show their faces and and uh, and, and uh, turn on their videos, uh, we'll turn to the sort of panel discussion now. Um, and what we're really trying to get at here is really to get your thoughts, sort of a sense of actually what's happening in practice. So. so so how have central banks and supervisors actually been looking at climate issues in the, in the crisis so far? Um, then as, as, as real experts in this, to get your response to the toolbox, the strengths, weaknesses, gaps, which we could be filling. And then perhaps to the end of the discussion, we'll, we'll go on to sort of what, what could be the, the next step. So uh, Frank, um, if I may start with you, you have a busy joint role, not only Chief Sustainable Finance Officer, but also Head of International Banking uh, Regulation. Maybe a, sort of an insight from you about how you have been thinking at, at BaFin about uh, the crisis and also the sustainability dimension, and then your reflections, Frank, on, on the toolbox itself. But the first word to you, Frank, if I may. Yeah, thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Well, actually, uh, coming from the sustainability side uh, or ESG side, uh, COVID-19 is the best example uh, for a social transition risk. So uh, what many people uh, haven't believed uh, till the crisis has started uh, was that transitional risks are not really seen. They are far, far away. So a long term issue, not a short term issue. And now we have really seen that a, a ESG or a social risk can affect or can hit uh, the markets uh, immediately, uh, can stop um, production and even services in entire uh, uh, sectors of the economies. And that was uh, what no one was really uh, believing before this crisis uh, has uh, appeared. And that is actually what uh, we see, uh, what we have warned about uh, for, for a longer time. Um, and now we have a very good uh, reasoning behind uh, everything uh, we are now requiring. So um, usually um, the crisis itself uh, in, in terms or in, in, in connection with, with uh, ESG or sustainability risks um, has to be addressed individually. So uh, all COVID measures are uh, individually addressed. All uh, sustainability issues are actually politically and uh, or monetary uh, or central banks driven. 
So that is not what we as supervisors, uh, and I speak as a supervisor here or a regulator, have uh, to bear in mind uh, from the beginning. However, we are coming from the risk side. And from the risk side, we have seen uh, a dramatic um, decrease uh, in production. So that is also uh, an issue not, so the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic crisis is not, not a financial crisis, at least not for now. It is a real economies crisis, which is affecting the financial crisis. That is a difference to the last crisis. Uh, in, in uh, 2007 and 8. So um, coming or considering uh, just this, that it is an economic crisis, um, you have, of course, not uh, the regulatory response first. It is more the political response. However, we, coming from, uh, we are coming from the risk side uh, or we are, we are addressing this issue from the risk side uh, as we have uh, seen all the risks as uh, all the sustainability risks also as a, a part of the, of the current uh, risk types. So we see it as credit risk, market risk, operational risk, um, liquidity risk, uh, insurance risk, and, and conduct risk. Those risk types include all the um, sustainability issues. And so we don't create a new risk. Uh, it was mentioned the NGFS has uh, marked this as a, a uh, important financial uh, stability risk. It is as it is named by the NGFS. However, it is not a single or a alone standing risk. Uh, it is just a part of the other risk with strong effects. Having said that, um, what we have, what has uh, have the supervisors done? Um, so we have, um, yeah, actually advised the governments, um, we were uh, also discussing this in, in the NGFS, to give some advice to the supervisors and central banks involved there um, on how to uh, deal with that uh, COVID-19 uh, versus sustainability issue. We have seen um, a tremendous movement towards um, just uh, rescue the economy um, don't be uh, too careful with the, with the uh, environment or with the social risks. So and that, is, that is what we have seen and uh, that is exactly the wrong way uh, to foster. And we were actually saying that um, every euro spent for a non-sustainability purpose is lost for the next decade, at least for the next decade. And that means um, we should be very, very careful in how the investments uh, go, uh, go on. So supervisors have, of course, uh, the specific views here. Uh, we, have, uh, start, uh, we have started an initiative at the NGFS to keep the re uh, green recovery uh, in mind, uh, to uh, also foster recovery plans uh, to be consistent uh, with the past to carbon neutrality, uh, and also uh, to have the benefits from a green recovery as one of the uh, main issues in mind. So uh, sustainability is uh, not just a risk, it is uh, also a chance and that is almost forgotten. And the huge chance uh, we see here is uh, to take the crisis or take the hard events of the crisis as a starting point uh, for, a, for the huge turn towards a new uh, sustainability policy. Uh, be it in a small uh, company, be it in a financial institution, be it in a political area, or be it in a regulatory area. And that is, that is what we have uh, started now uh, and what we have seen as most important um, as a reaction to this. On the toolbox box itself, um, it is exactly the right way forward. Uh, it is addressing uh, very ex excellently um, the the single uh, tools uh, which are really needed. Um, a big plus uh, to the new thinking on collateral that is needed. Here we have almost a problem and, and that, is, that is one of the, of, of the uh, minor minuses. Um, as soon as you are um, talking about changing the regulation, be it the calibration uh, or be it um, the overall uh, regulation, uh, make, make the regulation more greener, 
um, we are actually trapped um, in the uh, short-term, long-term issue. So uh, all the sustainability risks are long-term, or most of those are long-term, and the entire regulation uh, in banking and in insurance is short-term. That means no longer than three to five years. And here uh, we may need uh, to approve uh, most to get away on how to address uh, long-term risks in the currently uh, short-term uh, regulation or uh, to change the, the regulation towards a more long-term uh, view. What is uh, excellently done uh, as well is stress testing. Stress testing will be uh, one of the most uh, or the core parts uh, on how institutions, financial institutions can actually measure uh, the real risks. Um, and here, th th there is also a close com uh, co uh, combination or uh, linkage to the to the pillar two issue. So the current sustainability regulation might be or will be a, a pillar two regulation until we have uh, somehow solved the short term long term uh, problem. Um, I was also impressed about um, what was written uh, about disclosure. Here we need, of course, uh, at first the non-financial disclosure uh, at most. Um, here we can discuss on whether uh, international or national pools are uh, recommended, uh, on whether they should be publicly available so that every uh, enterprise uh, in, in a country or in a region uh, can have uh, access to that. Uh, here uh, we can discuss some, some finance structures, so uh, governments are uh, almost uh, willing to, uh, to pay for such a pool, uh, just to make clear that everyone is uh, using the same data and not inventing uh, actually new data uh, using for, for the own uh, uh, yeah, sustainability uh, purposes. Um, sustainable finance roadmaps, uh, last but not least, um, very good idea. So uh, the governments have already started with that. Uh, I think it is also useful to require sustainable finance roadmaps in every uh, authority uh, and even every uh, enterprise. Uh, with such a thinking behind, uh, you may uh, yeah, raise uh, the awareness, uh, especially on, 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 uh, on sustainability. Um, a little minus is on helicopter money. Uh, so we, I, I, I firmly not believing that uh, you can bound uh, helicopter money to, um, to sustainability goals. Uh, it is an either or, and either uh, everyone gets helicopter money, that is the, uh, the scope of, of helicopter money uh, or not. Um, I also missed some, uh, some statement on capacity building. So uh, we are talking about um, the biggest structural change of the economy since um, this, the 19th century. So the industrialization, industrialization was uh, as big as what we are uh, actually um, faced with uh, the uh, climate change. And um, here there must be some uh, capacity building or requests, at least for that, that every um, entity, authority, uh, government must ask him or herself uh, on where to, uh, uh, to get the resources. Uh, and that uh, even with, with just the limited resources, you won't uh, really reach uh, the final goal to be uh, efficient in, in, in fighting climate change. Um, that's with, with the toolbox. Um, and the third question was uh, on what uh, are the next steps. Uh, so we are, of course, aware of the risks. Um, I, as the supervisor, uh, strongly recommend to end the regulatory releases as soon as possible. So there have been many regulatory releases for now just to make the banks more stable, what uh, there is uh, ahead to us. So ahead to us is a huge change in, uh, in the financial uh, yeah, environment. So uh, financial undertakings will have to change um, their scopes. The business models have to be uh, adopted accordingly. 
Um, they should be aware uh, on the uh, transitional risks much, much better, uh, and hopefully they are now after the COVID-19 crisis. 19 crisis. Um, we are looking for uh, data pools, uh, as uh, I have mentioned already, uh, even, be, even as a public source. Um, and last but not least, we must convince our own supervisory staff um, that the world is now much, much riskier um, and um, those risky, uh, those, those riskiness uh, or this riskiness is actually stemming um, or is, is embedded in, in the current risk classes. So it is not a really new thinking it, uh, uh, on, on how risk is functioning. It is just a, a new need uh, to address this uh, very specific risk. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, uh, Frank. Very, very comprehensive response, and I'm sure lots of things to pick up in the discussion. But I think your your your, your signal at the beginning that this has been a sort of powerful wake up call about the the sort of system wide materiality of ESG uh, risks is, is very, very, very powerful. And then your 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 points about collateral, about disclosure, about roadmaps. Um, and capacity building. I think we, are, we are underestimate the capacity building needs, um, as, as, as you're saying, and, and good to focus on uh, issues like the data pools as we go, go forward. So thanks for that. Very, very helpful. Um, Irene, move to you. You've been working on these issues, doing some very serious research on these issues in terms of climate and, and regulation for, for a number of years now, publishing a lot of very, very insightful pieces. Um, how, how do you see the, the issues of central banks regulation and, and climate change come together? And, and then your thoughts, particularly on the, on, on the toolbox, because I know you've been doing some sort of very, very fresh research on this topic. So your views, Irene, would be very welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, you to discuss this very actual and I think uh, very research and policy relevant uh, topic for the very um, in the next few months. So just to follow the, your um, stream of questions, so what have uh, central banks uh, done with regards to climate in the COVID recovery? So on the one hand, uh, and I will focus on the EU since it's uh, <clears throat> My, uh, and my area of focus and maybe you could complement what Imi will say later. Um, on the one hand, uh, actually we saw a massive engagement of uh, central bank and in particular of the European Central Bank uh, by providing uh, um, liquidity, uh, liquidity lines and uh, renewing the asset purchase program. And for instance, uh, the European Central Bank uh, launched the um, <coughs> Uh, pandemic emergence purchase program, which is 1.35 trillion euros until uh, June 2021 at least. Then uh, it uh, revised and relaxed the collateral for um, eligibility, uh, sorry, um, relaxed the eligibility uh, for the uh, extension of the quantitative easing corporate purchase program. And then there were other uh, series of uh, actions, for instance, on um, relaxing conditions for non-performing loans and uh, also for um, prudential um, platforms for banks' minimum capital requirements. And all this, um, and plus also um, uh, grant fettering um, assets, uh, marketable assets that um, are uh, at the uh, triple B minus in order to be, make them eligible during the crisis in the Euro system credit, uh, Euro system, uh, credit um, market. And uh, uh, all this uh, represent actually really a massive amount of liquidity in the market. However, what we also have to uh, uh, mention and to recognize is that uh, there is, uh, despite the announcements that are very welcome by Christine Lagarde, last, uh, in particular the announcement that you was, was mentioned before last week, uh, these measures lack uh, clear climate coherence. And not only coherence with the policy framework and to the pre-COVID uh, policy framework in the European Union, and in particular with two major policies. First, the Green Deal program uh, that aims to make the EU um, climate neutral by 2050 and considers sustainability not only from an environmental point of view, but also from a point of view of social inclusion, and thus consider also tax justice and uh, um, 
uh, cohesion. Um, and thus, in this regard, as much to share with the European cohesion policy, which is the first voice of the European budget spending, but on the other end, also with the action plan on sustainable finance, and the, uh, which was launched uh, last year, and uh, recently we uh, added the approval of the one of the most debated points, which is the um, European Commission uh, sustainability taxonomy, and. Um, this is a major issue. I mean, this could lead to three major issues because first, by not targeting uh, asset purchase and by not including a clear conditionality uh, on um, the measures and with conditionality, I mean, okay, I support you, financial investor, if you can prove uh, that you are making advance, advances on disclosure and on the alignment of your portfolio and business, whatever it is, uh, to the um, European climate and energy targets, or at least to the um, uh, goals of the European uh, Commission Sustainable Finance Action Plan. And this is what I called, um, what I mentioned before, is in terms of three uh, C. So, what the central bank should, the European Central Bank should do is first to enforce uh, conditionality uh, of, um, of its policy measures no matter if monetary or prudential or other, because this is a strong, could be a strong signaling uh, on the market. The second would be to foster coherence uh, of uh, policy measures. Uh, and in this regard, the signaling is not so much to investors, but to uh, financial regulators and uh, policy makers. And in particular, with regard to the need to introduce a, car a stable uh, carbon pricing and carbon tax, to the need to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, and to the need to foster tax justice, because uh, we know that uh, governments are really under stress in terms of public debt increase and sustainability under the COVID, but we also know that uh, fiscal revenues are a main source of income for, for governments. So if we want serious governments to support or to be like a kind of green entrepreneurial state, then they need fiscal revenues. Uh, and third, the third C is promote complementarity of uh, policy measures and uh, instruments. And this is much in line with what we uh, wrote together with Uli Volz uh, on an um, open uh, discussion um, paper um, published two months ago with regard to the to foster complementarity of role of uh, European Commission and uh, European financial institutions and in particular European Investment Bank. That will be in charge, however, of the implementation of the financial part of the Green Deal and also the European cohesion policy, which are two main pillars for the European Union in the years to come. And thus, by doing so, the, uh, on the one hand, the European Central Bank could lead by example and also signal both policymakers and the market. Not doing so and um, providing a business, supporting a business as usual recovery actually could lead to three uh, results. Maybe in the short term, the economy will get back to uh, cl close to um, pre-COVID levels, but actually this will create the conditions to increase the vulnerability of our socioeconomic system to future pandemic crises, because we know from recent research uh, that uh, um, ecosystem depletion and pollutions uh, actually increase the vulnerability of our system to exogenous shocks. And this is uh, also when it comes to the real economy and finance and financial stability, this is also the result of a recent research that I led for um, in collaboration with the World Bank on the impact on the macroeconomic and financial impact assessment of uh, compounding COVID uh, climate and financial risk. And what emerged from that analysis is that uh, spending better in times of crisis allows governments and, uh, to spend less in the mid to long term. And thus, uh, while in contrast, promoting a business as usual uh, recovery could create the conditions for um, uh, increasing vulnerability instead of building resilience in the near future already. Uh, last but not least, uh, neglecting these aspects uh, would lead central banks uh, to uh, contribute to the materialization of uh, climate-related financial risk in the market and uh, um, thus I mean, putting financial stability um, at risk 
and also actually to uh, activate, uh, to decrease the trust of financial institutions in the whole um, uh, engagement and uh, in the uh, credibility of the uh, process of greening uh, policies, both fiscal and monetary policies, what, was, uh, what started and was well on track before the COVID crisis. So when it comes to then to uh, the, um, to the toolbox, I think that there are two major strengths that really deserve attention. The first one is the clarity of presenting results of where central banks stand, what they did, and second, in, um, uh, in suggesting and uh, developing operational steps that uh, central banks could, uh, could, uh, could take to better align the COVID recovery to uh, the climate targets based on, uh, and these are evidence-based uh, steps. So we will provide uh, nine tools uh, organizing for priorities and these are based both on research evidence and also on best practices. And I think that this is very important to uh, 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 really in, in practice support uh, central banks uh, in this uh, important process. What I would also say, however, since I've been, my research is mostly focusing on uh, uh, developing and applying climate stress test methodologies uh, in collaboration with several central banks and financial regulators in Europe, is um, a remark. So the result of, uh, of our recent uh, uh, paper that is, uh, was published just a couple of weeks ago with Stefano, in collaboration with Stefano Battiston, showed that getting this, uh, the climate transition scenario wrong could lead to an underestimation of the probability of default of investors when we consider corporate and sovereign bonds portfolio of at least 10%. This is massive. And thus, uh, the message that I would like to share and probably a point of discussion that I would like to open on this uh, on how, um, how, uh, what is important to know to do climate stress testing is that the choice of the climate transition scenarios matter and in particular, to, uh, we need to consider the uncertainty connected to climate transition scenarios and thus, in doing climate stress tests, we need to consider a broad uh, number of climate of feasible climate transition scenarios because sticking on a few uh, even extreme but only a few climate transition scenarios could risk to get the uh, to un severely underestimate uh, the risk associated for investors and this of course have uh, as implications for uh, financial regulators and central banks in charge of financial stability fantastic well thanks Irene very very comprehensive and I'm sure um, uh, questions around scenarios is close to many of our, our hearts. I know there's all means to be working on that intensively. I'm sure, Frank, you've been looking at uh, a lot as well. So thanks, Irene, uh, for that. Uh, very comprehensive and uh, Ilmi, if I could come to come to you, um, the uh, inspiration for Inspire and, um, and and working on many many aspects of this. Your reflections on the sort of situation we find ourselves in and how central banks and the crisis have been wrapped up and maybe sort of some of the ways ways through uh, this particular crisis we're facing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Nick. Um, I, f I feel um, I have a bit of a conflict of interest in commenting on the toolbox as a third party as it's an inspired product. And I obviously think it's absolutely fantastic. So <laughs> I want to comment. Um, on the moment we're in and why the toolkit is needed. And also since I'm going last amongst us, I wanted to share something a bit different and maybe um, wake everyone up as, at the, as they're at the end of, most of you are at the end of your day, although I'm at the beginning of mine. So I wanted to start by talking about um, the cultural anthropology of taboos. Um, humans um, have long used taboos as a way of creating very clear social sanctions around behaviors and practices that bear risks so great that they benefit from very strong prohibitions. Implicit in the concept of a taboo is the implication that perhaps there lurks a better, more nuanced position, but that the dangers are so great or the slippery slope is so slippery that developing or promulgating a strict norm is, is very important. Central banking is replete with these sorts of cultural totems and rituals 
I won't try to enumerate all of them, but they include some very important taboos. Um, these aren't formal limitations on the operations of central banks, but they're prudent cultural practices that develop a sort of ritual meaning. A few important examples. One, central banks ward off political interference with norms and rituals, amongst them the taboo around monetary financing of fiscal deficits. I can't imagine anyone making the argument that, in good faith, that um, some, some moderate amount of monetary financing of expenditure would not be superior to none. The argument goes, though, that the fruit is too sweet once tasted, and that this leads to government interference in central bank operations, and this could lead to inflation and instability. I think we need to look no further than my own country right now to appreciate that this risk is very, very real uh, of, of government interference. And so the norm is created to protect from that. Another norm, market neutrality, avoids the risk of a more directive approach to asset purchasing that devolves into relying on the central bank for, for central planning. Um, third example, an interesting one because it's a taboo that's, that's evolved. Inflation targeting, the sort of one goal, one instrument paradigm pre-2008 and the 2008 crisis, has given way to an evolved understanding of the role of central banks in managing financial stability as crucial to delivering their mandate. And that's changed. That's an evolved um, uh, principle only in roughly the last decade. Um, with taboos, there are always exceptional contexts. And this is why I wanted to bring this up today. When we're on the brink of an economic or financial crisis, this creates a context in which banks can maintain the culture of identifying these taboos and maintaining them, but also treat the circumstances as being so unique as permitting exception. So COVID-19 and the corollary supply and demand shocks imposed by the health impacts and the necessary policy response have cre created what one would call a permission structure for governments to take unusual measures in ways that are not seen as violating those taboos. The response to the crisis gives us a window into the power of central banks when they identify the right cultural frame to avoid the risk posed by, um, uh, by implementing measures that are under what are considered normal circumstances prescribed. In this case, the toolkit outlines 177 um, instruments and uh, measures taken by central banks in response to COVID-19, um, many of which are highly unconventional um, by, uh, by sort of normal practice of, of central banks. I see this as having two implications for climate change that I wanted to highlight. First, it reveals, and I, and I um, say this fully aware of how uh, ambitious and interested in climate change and sustainability um, our colleagues working within the NGFS are, um, and we've had ample opportunity to inspire and in, interact with them, but it does reveal that central banks and supervisors have yet to fully grasp or grapple with the crisis that climate change presents. The quote unquote unique circumstances of climate change should, but as yet not quite, um, have not quite been treated as creating the permission structure to recalibrate norms in the way that COVID-19 has. Surely any serious look at the economic and financial implications of climate change merit recalib recalibrating our assumptions about appropriate central banking measures in at least as major a way as COVID-19 has. But second, it also shows us that there are ways to protect the higher principles of these institutions that are genuinely important to their effectiveness, independence, technocratic policy making, a dogged focus on um, these institutions' mandates and delivering those mandates, while calibrating operations with a more nuanced policy position. So drawing from the examples above, there may be structured ways to approach monetary and real economy coherence that diminish the risk of political interference, such as financing through national development banks, these are government owned, but operated independently, um, or through enabling municipal governments through some more robust version of 
the US's municipal liquidity facility that it's unrolled in the context of COVID. Expanding these channels could have enormous benefits on uh, addressing the public investment needs of decarbonization of the economy and ruggedization in the face of climate change, but could be potentially managed to maintain some of the values connected with independence. Um, as Frank put it, uh, this is the largest structural transformation in the economy since the Industrial Revolution. If this is not done through, for, well, for example, well-run government development banks, as is done in Germany, France, and Canada, there's a risk that the private sector will not provide sufficient capital for this transformation. We don't have a development bank in the US, but I'll note there is interest in establishing a climate infrastructure bank, but the opportunity to link it to the Fed has not yet been seriously explored. There is also an urgent need for central banks to act to correct massive market failures, uh, in particular those posed by climate risk. Risk weighting for forward looking climate risk seems to be a truer articulation of the principle of a well functioning market economy and therefore of market neutrality that delivers the, the that corrects for mispricing. However, it does require central banks and fin financial regulators to take a, on a more proactive corrective function and to do that at sufficient scale. If we believe climate risk implies a mispricing then the implementation of, of regulatory tools and corrective measures in central banking and supervisory operations is important. There are, of course, positive steps within, within central banks, and Frank's alluded to integration of some of these risks in the current framework of supervision, but they are too limited and too slow. Um, another good example uh, is central bank advice. In the context of COVID, we see central banks providing an absolutely crucial role in advising government in the context of crisis management. If central banks saw climate as, a, as an equally urgent crisis, it would merit a more forceful, sophisticated, and prescriptive role in advising government, whether that's behind closed doors or otherwise. So too, for that matter, for market guidance. Um, forward guidance may be one of the more obvious opportunities to address the tragedy of the horizon, where, um, uh, where consideration of longer term risks could be integrated very practically. So I want to turn to the excellent toolkit that my colleagues Nick, Uli, and Simon prepared. Why is it a toolkit? Why did we call it a toolkit? <laughs> um, because it shows the full panoply of instruments available to central banks and supervisors to marshal against the risks of climate change if it were treated in a, as a comparable challenge to COVID-19. What this does is get us out of the hand-wringing of whether central banks can or should use these sorts of instruments into the much more interesting question about how to apply them effectively to address climate change. This is crucial because even if the 177 measures that have been identified in that toolkit are not the full list of potential measures, even just applying those would have an enormous impact in managing and diminishing climate risk to the economy, to society, and to the market. Obviously, at this stage, it's a little bit more of a, a stock list than a toolkit um, in the sense that um, more work on many of these would need to be done to um, make them um, um, uh, applicable in, in operations. Um, but there are, uh, aspects of this that are well developed and have been applied um, already by, by central banks in, in other contexts and supervisors in other contexts. So market questionnaires, stress testing on climate, other supervisory tools have been implemented by insurer in, uh, for insurers. And um, there are not practical impediments to applying those now. Um, we at Inspire are really eager to help equip institutions however we can and really it's beholden upon these financial authorities to, to start to repurpose these tools quickly and apply them in the current crisis um, to avoid compounding the risk um, from the application of these tools without integrating sustainability and climate change considerations in them in response to COVID. So the toolkits identified very concrete priorities, amend collateral frameworks to better account for climate change and other environmental risks, align asset purchase programs and refinancing operations with Paris goals, adjust prudential measures to avoid 
the uh, manifestation of transition risk on the balance sheet of financial institutions and adopt sustainable and responsible investment principles for portfolio management, including policy portfolios. Climate change is urgent, but this kind of understates the urgency of the moment. The implementation of monetary and fiscal stimulus at such a large scale due to COVID without integrating sufficiently climate change prevention measures could be a disaster. On the other hand, many of these programs will take some time to implement, and I'd say retrofitting climate change considerations into their operations is still possible, even if challenging. And that is what truly urgent looks like. Thanks. Elmi, thank you very much. Thanks for, for waking us all up with some great thoughts there. I think there's there's a really, really interesting, and, a, and, a, and I think actually, to some extent, your question, your focus on culture, we often focus on the culture of financial institutions, but the culture of, um, of regulatory authorities is very interesting, and maybe sort of sits a little bit frank with the, way, the emphasis you were putting on capacity building as, as, as well. So, Simon and Uli, thanks for coming back. We'd just love you to see you again, uh, particularly that great uh, bookshelf of yours, uh, Uli. Simon and Uli, I, I'd be really, really welcome your thoughts. I mean, the three of us put together the, the, the toolbox, but your reflections are not actually what you've heard from uh, uh, the practitioner, the, the supervisor, uh, Frank, uh, the, the, the researcher, Irene, and then uh, Ilmi, the um, cultural anthropologist of climate action. Um, your, your thoughts. And then we got two questions so, online. So thanks very much to, to Mike and Dilemi. Uh, other, other questions, please. I, 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 can, I, I can see many of you. I know your names. Uh, and I, so I might shout, shout out. But please, now is the time to ask questions. But um, Uli and Simon, your sort of thoughts on what you've heard and, and the reflections you've got from these, these three uh, experts. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, well, first of all, thanks a lot to, to uh, the discussions. These were really very rich comments. And um, I'd like to, to first uh, pick on a, some very specific points. Um, uh, Frank, you mentioned uh, mentioning of helicopter money in, in the toolbox, and I was actually had to look it up. And, and uh, you, you did read it more carefully than I, I did. But um, I, I'd like to emphasize that we have uh, in the toolbox included a lot of different tools that have either been used in one context or another or have been proposed and we, we then uh, basically looked at you know what would be a climate sustainability aligned calibration and uh, I think we are quite careful in saying that uh, you know not every tool is appropriate for everyone at the same time. Yeah, so it's very important to ha highlight that uh, with central banks and also supervisors, there are different traditions, uh, different approaches. Very importantly, we have very significant differences across financial markets regarding their structure. Um, so, uh, you know, certain instruments may be very appropriate uh, in a certain developing country context, uh, whereas, say, in the German financial system, they may be, uh, may be uh, inappropriate and uh, or not feasible. So I think uh, it's really important to, to say that there is, um, uh, one has to be very careful when, when designing specific policies, so context matters a lot. Um, and I personally, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a fan of helicopter money, but um, uh, there are some who, who, who uh, also have good arguments why it may be a good idea. Um, the second comment I want to make also picks up on, on what you said, uh, said, Frank, regarding capacity building. Now, um, I'm actually very much in the business of capacity building. I work at a university and uh, we're also um, actually next week we are running next week, uh, next two weeks, we're running a summer school on sustainable finance, but we also have uh, professionals, also regulators uh, as participants, but also um, uh, students. And, and we are uh, working with central banks uh, in, in developing capacities. Um, so I think this is one of the key points together with the point that, that Ilmi raised, culture change. Um, so this is not really about do, tinkering at the edges. We really need to rewire the financial system. We are talking about, I mean, if we are serious about um, the low carbon transition, we are looking at a very substantial 
change in, in our economic structures. And finance has to be part of that change. And uh, so uh, building the necessary capacities in the regulatory supervisory community uh, in the financial sector um, is absolutely crucial. And, and culture change has to be part of that because um, unless uh, there really is a, is a, a realization uh, among uh, everyone in the financial sector that climate change sustainability is not just some, some add-on, um, we're not going to see the changes that we need to see. And I'll stop here. Oi, thanks, thanks for that. Um, Simon, any, any reflections? Uh, yes, just, just one brief point. Um, um, yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for these, for these very helpful comments. And if I may pick up on, on, on Frank's uh, next steps, which I, which I thought were very, well, basically were exactly what motivated us for the, for the central narrative of this toolbox, that we empirically observed that a lot of central banks with regard to macroprudential regulation and a lot of supervisors started to ease or, or release their, um, their, their regulations and um, uh, that counter cyclical instruments were eased. So, I mean, this is, I mean, this is quite, quite worrying to observe, as, as Frank said, in the context of transition risks, potentially not being fully, uh, fully incorporated. So this is, I think this is a, this is a very um, sensitive point here that, that central banks are, are rapidly expanding liquidity in the market, while, um, while well, you would expect counter cyclical buffers to be, or, or counter cyclical instruments to be eased in, in an economic downturn. But in the context of climate risk, I think this, this paints a quite worrying picture. So I'm, 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 I'm very um, interested to hear, to hear Frank's, or I was very interested to hear Frank's thoughts on this and observation as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. So we have a couple of questions, and I think there are also some themes which you've all been touching on. So two questions. One uh, from Mike Knight, really thinking about, uh, is there a role for global carbon price benchmarks as a climate risk metric for central banks? So one. And then I think one from uh, Delaney Orotsko, um, perhaps Frank picking up on your point about this sort of short long-term risk um, challenge that you, you highlighted. Uh, do you believe there's a risk that short-term regulation not taking into account sustainability will just lead to increased risks in the medium term? So those are the two we have so far. We have many other participants who could uh, could ask questions. Maybe Frank, if I could, I could turn to you. Um, and particularly, I think you ended your comments about the importance of um, talking to your supervisory staff and convincing them that the world has become much riskier. And I don't know whether anything that Ilmi was saying on the cultural norms sort of rang true with you. I mean, what, what did you make of, of that, that framework that Ilmi had laid out? Hmm. Well, um, supervisors are actually mirroring the society. So uh, we have the same believers, the same uh, structures there. Uh, same schools, um, and so uh, supervisors are not different from, from that. Uh, and um, as we know that uh, there is a lot of education uh, still needed in terms of uh, the new challenges ahead to us, um, supervisors have exactly to do the same. And that is, that is what I've mentioned with that mm -hmm. part uh, on, on uh, we have improved our own uh, ambitions uh, here uh, as well. So, with, yeah. Very good, Frank. And, and, and any, any reflections on these two, these, these two points? The question about some form of carbon price benchmark, which could help with stress testing, and then this question of, which you were touching on, I think you, you pointed to about this, this problem that a lot of our financial regulation is orientated towards short-term risk risk management, whereas many of the other issues we're looking towards long-term. Actually, from the risk side, um, a well-set carbon price uh, would already help a lot. So if, if we had a real, real price, so in, in Germany, we think that the real price for carbon should be 130 euros a ton, uh, which would be uh, much, much more than the current one. But uh, with that price, we would have uh, the, um, yeah, 
a kind of a leeway function uh, towards the economy, uh, towards uh, a real change. And uh, once that price would be uh, incorporated, uh, we would have not the problem with the, with the regulation itself, because right. then the uh, external costs are already internalized. And as soon as the costs would be internalized, uh, we would have no problem in, in terms of the uh, financial market regulation. That, that would be um, an excellent uh, move uh, for us uh, uh, as, as supervisors. Um, however, we also uh, know that uh, according to the, to the current taxonomies, um, all, all taxonomies just identified what is green. No taxonomy is identifying what is really brown. And that is, that is also an issue of, of the concept as long as we have just determined what is green and we know that about 10% of the European assets are green or sustainable, that means that 90% uh, are not green. And translated to the uneducated uh, people, that would mean uh, if it is not green, it is brown. So, uh, and 90% and brown uh, would mean you would kill uh, the entire economy if you come up with, with a, a carbon price that is much, much beyond uh, the current pricing system. Um, yeah. that's, that's why we see uh, a stepwise uh, um, increase of the carbon price as uh, really necessary to reach uh, the Paris goals uh, without a higher carbon price. Uh, we never meet that goal uh, because uh, every economy is price related uh, and, and if there is no price function uh, behind that. Uh, the movement wouldn't be there. It is not, economy, uh, economics uh, is not just, and Irene would, would uh, confirm to that, uh, is not just uh, ideology. It is much more than that. And uh, the most trigger behind that is money. Yeah, no, very good. So, and, and I think one of the things that we've learned through particularly the focus in the last few months around Black Lives Matter is the sort of what comes with words. And Uli, you highlighted an article that had been written about on some of the implications of brown and I, I've, I've sort of thought in my mind Frank that maybe a sort of traffic light system might be clearer that we have things which we know are green things which we probably know are red that are not compatible and actually the broad economy is some going to be somewhere in the amber we don't quite know yet yeah that would um, be it would be regular from, from the regulatory purpose it would be uh, easily to hand because we have a normal uh, distribution function so we, we have a uh, right. yeah uh, the outer part of, of, of the head uh, would be green and brown, and then, and then you have the middle, um, and then the, the goal must be to make the middle uh, as flat as possible. Very good. Well, that's maybe a target for all of us to work towards. That's a, that's a, that's a nice dynamic image we have there. So thank, thanks very much, Frank. Um, I, Irene, what do you, I mean, you've just completed a big piece of, piece of work. You highlighted um, the sort of importance of, sort of the coherence of policies, complementarity of policies. I think Ilmi, your point about public banks sort of fetters into that sort of institutional complementarity and then conditionality. Where do you see their scope for the last of those three, which are perhaps the sort of toughest for um, particularly monetary authorities to talk about? Where do you think there's scope for that conditionality in terms of provision of liquidity and linking those with, with climate? Well, uh, the most obvious things, uh, uh, the most obvious point uh, is uh, uh, to introduce it uh, in the um, eligibility for the asset purchasing programs because uh, uh, we um, we expect them to remain with us. To, uh, we expect asset purchasing programs to remain with us for rather long. But uh, and this is something that has been long discussed already. Uh, I mean, at least in the in the last uh, couple of years, um, but. Uh, and this, I mean, we, uh, it's a point that deserves attention and on which central banks should focus. On the other hand, however, I'll less discuss this to green in the collateral system uh, in general, but also uh, in particular what pertains to the long-term refinancing operation measures, because this is uh, important to signal banks, well, in particular, uh, well before then talking about the change in uh, potential regulation like uh, green supporting factor and brown penalizing factor. So I think that this is very, very important. On the other hand, um, oh, uh, when we talk about uh, um, 
complementarity, I would like to um, connect to what uh, to uh, the point made by ILMI on uh, national development banks. I mean, in Europe, we have the European Investment Bank, which is uh, defines itself as the EU bank. It was also the first to issue green bonds uh, in 2007 already, and we'll be in charge of implementing, uh, of overseeing the implementation of the two major policies in Europe. And uh, uh, one of them is the Green Deal, and the other one is the cohesion policy with the cohesion structure of funds. So I think that it's fundamental to uh, um, explore uh, possibilities to connect and opportunities to, con to um, connect what the European Central Bank is doing with what the, Europe the European Investment Bank is doing within, of course, the respective mandates of the institutions. But I think that this will be very important, both to give strong signals to markets and uh, um, governments, and also to increase the effectiveness of the money that we spend. Yeah, no, I, I, th I, think, that's, I think that's right, exactly right. And I think, yeah, the union has fantastic opportunities with sort of very, very well functioning organizations such as the IB to, to, to have that coordination. I was struck um, as I was listening to Frank Ilmi, um, obviously talking about the, the important, the central importance of, of carbon pricing uh, and so on uh, to make markets uh, work better. And you had talked in your uh, analysis, particularly about the sort of the corrective role of, of regulators. I suppose in the absence of perfect pricing in markets, um, the role for regulators to sort of to, to, to bear down on some of the, these market failures which are being sort of exhibited in, in, in the assets that banks and others are holding. So any, any thoughts about how in a sense that, 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 could, um, that could go forward? Yeah, sure. And um, I'll come back to culture in that as well. I'll just make an observation. The first um, time that I saw the chair of the NGFS um, speak as chair um, at an NGFS conference, Frank Elderson made the observation that it is really important that central banks act on climate change because there is no plan B. And actually, I think um, I, I, in my conversation with him afterwards, I made the observation that in a way what we are dealing with in central banking and supervision and its relationship to climate change is a plan B, which is to say, if we hadn't properly addressed climate change in 1992, um, and in the following decade, it would not pose a financial stability or macroeconomic risk. There may be, have been costs to it or public policy implications to it and societal implications, but the, but the issues that arise it, as, as it relates to central banking and supervisory mandates would not be what they are now. Good illustration is a carbon price. Um, and so I, I think that the point here is that um, because this could have been addressed by government does not absolve central banks and supervisory authorities from addressing it now that it falls within their mandate. Um, and so uh, uh, the absence of a carbon price doesn't relinquish that responsibility. I'll draw a quick parallel here, which is that housing issues in the US could have been addressed by economic policy they were inadequately addressed by economic policy. They led to a bubble, which led to an economic crisis. It doesn't mean that because it was rooted in housing and economic policy, that it was no longer a financial stability risk for central banks and supervisors. So um, the issue though, as, as Frank, I think you pointed out really well, is that we act like the decision-making of these institutions are entirely technocratic, but the reality is that they are cultural and um, what we have with COVID is a permission structure to take this on. The signal that these institutions get from society is, this is a big enough deal that you are licensed to use all of these measures. And um, so there's a degree to which that you know, cuts against the idea that this is purely technocratic. Anyone who takes climate change really seriously and looks at the numbers sees this as a crisis. But it is hard because of the time horizons, et cetera, because it is a green swan more than a black swan to treat it in the same way culturally with the institutions. And so we're kind of in this conundrum. So I wanted to, to flag, flag that. Um, uh, just also to come back quickly on the question of short termism, um, because, you know, um, uh, Frank, you brought up the value of stress testing as a tool. And I just wanted to flag that what's interesting here is that um, 
stress testing as a tool is, you know, a, a relatively recent um, uh, tool in the arsenal um, to address financial stability risk. And yet it is framed around a set of risks that are really uh, short term. And one of the things that we need to do, uh, of course, is understand tail risks better, which are what stress tests are, are good at doing. And, and I read this new paper, I really look forward to reading this. But also the nature of climate change and green swans are not really tail risks. This is the central scenario that we're headed towards. And so these are not sort of the 5% scenarios that we have to deal with. And so there's a degree to which even stress tests, a tool like stress testing has to involve to address the nature of this risk. So if we really kind of mainstream the issue, a lot of the tools we have really do have to evolve relatively quickly, even though they're just recent evolutions um, at a historic scale in the arsenal of, of central banks. So I do want to flag that, and I do think there are real um, challenges to making sure we're treating uh, climate risks um, in a way that addresses their nature, as opposed to analogizing them to other types of financial risk. Well, thanks, Omi. Um, we're now uh, out of time, unfortunately, to, to the audience and the participants. I, I'm eating into your, your own free time, so apologies for that, because time is a non-renewable resource. Um, uh, Irene kicked us off with three Cs, and as I've been listening to you, I've been playing myself a game. I've now got 11 Cs of what I've heard for you, so I'm just going to relay these back to you. Um, so, Frank, you talked about the chance, actually. You talked about the chance of this, this, this crisis making us more uh, aware of the catastrophic implications of climate change. I think this, this importance of policy coherence, Irene, you highlighted, and, and complementarity in that link with the development banks, very important. Um, Ilmi, your point about correct the corrective function in imperfect markets, where we do have market failures, the, the role that supervisors and central banks can play. Conditionality um, uh, with the focus on asset purchases, perhaps, is a, a good place to go. Then these sort of two areas of the cultural norms and the capacity building, um, and then sort of particular tools we were thinking about. Um, we, we, we pointed to collateral frameworks and also to these counter-cyclical measures and obviously the, the potential for calibration. And then the final, my number 11 in the football team, is that actually climate risk and climate catastrophe and wider environmental issues are no longer the tail, but they are set there, the central scenario. And I think that's a very profound point you made of it and Ilmi. So thanks to our presenters, Uli and, and Simon. Thanks very much, Frank, Irene and Ilmi for, for the responses. I, these, this is very, very, as a, one of the co-authors, this is very, very helpful. Um, and uh, we are we will be processing the, this and uh, taking some of these themes forward. So watch this space. Look out for the next uh, edition of of the toolbox. Uh, thanks for your questions and thanks to the audience for for listening. So that's the the end of the session, and I enjoyed it immensely. So thanks to our panelists and uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>